welcome to the segment of Credit Matters TV. My name is Sabine Gromer and I'm the analytical manager for the oil and gas team here in Europe. Today we have a special treat for you. Standard & Poor's has recently published an article following a series of intense news flow on recent sector developments, particularly in emerging markets. So today, for the first time, we are connecting to three foreign offices outside of London. We're connecting to uh, Russia, to our Moscow office, to speak with Elena Anankina, Senior Director in the Oil & Gas Team here in Europe. We will also connect to Gloria Liu, she's a director in our Hong Kong office, and Fabiola Ortiz, she's a director in our Mexico City office. Following the surge in North American gas and more recently the oil production over the past decade, the oil and gas sectors in emerging markets are currently in the limelight through recent efforts to, on the one hand, secure long-term energy supply, such as we've seen in the recent China transaction between Gazprom and China, on the other hand, the significant push to develop and explore alternative sources such as shale gas in Latin America or in the Ukraine and Russian crisis and other political crises such as Iraq. Obviously, the news flow has been very heavy recently and it will be Im important to understand the implications for oil and gas producers. So Fabiola, maybe let's start with you. Given the vast potential of unconventional resources in Latin America, what would be the main challenges, do you think, for oil and gas companies in, and the potential impact on those companies' ratings? Thanks, Sabine. As you just mentioned, there is a vast potential of shale reserves in the region. However, the exploration and development has been slow. In our opinion, one of the main challenges for the oil and gas company is to evaluate whether the exploration of these resources is economically viable. As the U.S. experience has demonstrated, drilling for shale oil and gas is more costly because it requires new technologies and equipment. Another important challenge is the environmental issue, as most of the Latin American countries do not have any specific regulation regarding this issue. Therefore, we believe that the bulk of the oil and gas production in the region will continue to come from conventional resources in the next three to five years. Regarding credit implications, we believe that greater development of these resources in the region will benefit the business risk profile of the oil and gas companies, as it will diversify their hydrocarbon resources and will significantly increase the amount of non-conventional reserves. Additionally, once of these resources are developed, it will improve its cash flow generation and its profitability. However, we do not expect this to have an impact on the credit quality of their or to become a key rating factor in the medium term. Thank you, Fabiola. Now, Elena, let me continue with you in Moscow. There are currently obviously three key topics that are on everyone's mind when they think about oil and gas related matters in the Russian and CIS region. Firstly, the recent deal between Gazprom and China, of course. Secondly, potential tax changes that might have impact on the oil and gas majors in the region. And then third, but not least, the political unrest in the Ukraine. In your opinion, what do you think is the impact of the ongoing situation in the Ukraine and in Russian oil and gas companies in the region? Well, the general trend in the Russian oil and gas ratings is negative, mostly because of the sovereign developments. In April 2014, we have lowered our sovereign rating on Russia, and triggered by that were our rating actions and outlook revisions on a number of Russian oil and gas players. We currently do not have any Russian oil and gas companies or res any Russian corporates at all rated above the sovereign. The reasons for that are, first of all, for government-related entities, we do not expect them to be rated above the sovereign because we see the risk that the government can uh, put additional investment or social mandates on such companies with very strong link to the government. Uh, which could pressure their credit quality. For some other government-related entities, we include an uplift for our expectation of state support in the rating, and therefore they cannot be rated above the government either. As for private companies, such as Lukoil or Novatech, we do not see them as sufficiently resilient to a sovereign stress scenario. Therefore, their ratings are constrained by the sovereign as well. But having said that, standalone credit profiles of big Russian oil and gas companies remain uh, intact. Uh, they are supported by the company's strong competitive positions, their massive production, reserves, 
profitable operations which have not been interrupted by any sanctions. We see financial metrics for many of the Russian oil and gas companies as very solid, and at the moment we see their liquidity as adequate. Having said that, we continue to monitor their liquidity given that access to international capital markets has been very limited in recent months. So far, liquidity of large players is supported by their solid free cash flow generation, uh, relatively big cash balances, refinancing available from Russian state-owned banks, and for some players, by long-term customer prepayments. But we'll see how long this can last, and we will definitely monitor uh, their liquidity situation going forward. Thank you, Elena. Um, finally, Gloria, what are the implications of Gazprom's contract with CMPC for China's evolving energy structure and just generally the, the Chinese outlook on uh, energy standards? In our view, the Gazprom contract is a positive for China's evolving energy structure. First of all, this transaction will help China to meet its strong demand for gas. Such demand is supported by China's continued economic growth, urbanization, and need to achieve carbon emission targets and environmental protection. We estimate that the natural gas consumption will grow at an annual rate of 10 to 15 percent between 2014 and 2020, way above the China's GDP growth rate in the same period of time. Secondly, we, we expect China's gas consumption to continue to out, outspace China's domestic production, leading to a high dependence on, on imported gas. Imported gas is likely to remain as high as 35 to 40 percent of China's total gas supply over the mid to long term, unless there's a breakthrough in China's commercial production of long conventional resources, such as shale gas. Certainly, this transaction will make China's source of imported gas more diversified. After this transaction, China will have four main sources of gas import. One is the Lost West pipe gas from Central Asia. Second is the Lost East pipe gas from Russia. Third is the, is the Southwest pipe gas from Myanmar. And also the LNG shipments from Middle East, Australia, and other places. We estimate by 2020 that the gas from Russia is likely to account for 10% of total gas supply in China. Thanks a lot, Gloria, Elena and Fabiola. It was a pleasure to have you with us today. And this concludes our segment of Crave Matters TV. Should you have any questions on any of the topics discussed, please feel free to reach out to any of us anytime. Thank you for watching.